Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Kowalski, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. We are thrilled to have a lot of our partner CFA society represented, especially across the US, especially folks from New York City, Boston, and Washington, DC. Also delighted to welcome my international audience from Boston to Barbados, Germany to Greece, Canada to Kuwait. This is a, a wonderful opportunity to learn more about the CFA designation. Many of you may be thinking why Kaplan is launching this initiative. Objective is to help people like yourselves make an informed decision about their chartered financial analyst journey. Please note that in the middle of your screen, right on the bottom, the Q&A is open and will remain throughout. We hope that this session would be highly interactive and our five distinguished panelists are standing by to share their prepared remarks as well as take your questions, which I will read out of the chatter and pose to the distinguished panel. Kaplan is here to help you. We are a leading CFA test provider with a long history of associating with the CFA community, be it at societies, best colleges and universities, as well as our alliance partners such as ETF Global. All of us are united in the mission of making informed choices, and I know 40% of you are undergraduates and 20% are postgraduates. And with the advent of remote learning, and CFA Institute switching to computer-based testing, now may arguably be the best time to undertake the charter and distinguish yourself in a competitive jobs market. Kaplan offerings are here to help you. We provide self-led options, in-depth videos, detailed textbooks, review boot camps, and unrivaled question bank. But at the end of the day, the question remains, is this a right choice for you? Why and how would you be successful in earning those price three letters CFA after your name? And are you doing it for the right reasons? Well, what are those reasons? We sincerely thank those of you that took time to fill out the pre-event survey and 60% or so of you want to learn more about what's inside the box, what's in the charter. We are fortunate enough to have panelists at all stages of their CFA journey. They can help you with that. The uh, most popular thing that respondents to a survey wanted to know are who's the charter for and a typical career path. As luck would have it, we have panelists that distinguish results in all areas of finance and investment management, and they are eager to share the insights as to how the designation helped them on their professional journey. I know that roughly 30% of you have already enrolled and are interested in learning some tips and suggestions on how to make this a good experience. We have some uh, already ideas uh, that the panelists have shared and I love those. Plus at the end of our hour together, 15 or so minutes will be dedicated specifically to your questions. I already see we've got one or two coming in. Please keep them coming. It's truly the best part of this session. And I can see that we are motivated enough to spend uh, one hour together on this Wednesday, um, evening, afternoon, or morning for you as it happens. So talk about motivation. Let me pose this to our panelists. Trevor, maybe starting with you, why did you, as you introduce yourself, decide to pursue the CFA chatter? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, so anyway, my, my name is Trevor Lee. Um, I'm head of finance and operations for Reference Point, a boutique management consultancy in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Um, for me, pursuing the CFA charter was all about distinguishing myself within the world of financial services. Um, my career is a little different than some others who go into the investment management industry. Um, I've made a career in consulting. Um, began with Ernst & Young, working with financial services firms. 
So many of my clients were also CFA charter holders. And I, I got very interested in the program through talking to them and, and seeing what they worked on every day. In a client service role, you look for ways to relate to the people with whom you're working. Um, the CFA was a way to distinguish myself and, and develop my expertise in the world in which I was working, financial services. Since then, I've had the opportunity to move internal into a corporate finance role, uh, where I'm currently help running the, the operations and the finances for a, for a consulting firm. So again, leveraging what I learned through the program, budgeting, analysis, um, all the skills that are requisite in the program, I'm now applying to, to help run my own company. Um, so it was truly a challenging program, but a way to get to know the industry in which I was working, uh, build relationships and develop additional skills. And then maybe Gary, uh, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, sure. So hello to everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to speak with you today. My name is Gary Sarkissian. I'm the Director of Education and Content at CFA Society Boston. Uh, prior to my role here, I was actually in the investment management industry. I spent five years working on buy side equity research. And then before that, I was working on the sell side. I've also had experience in the private wealth space. Uh, as far as Paul's question, so why did I pursue the CFA charter? Um, so I got my charter, uh, I passed level three back in uh, 2010. And at that time, uh, I was at a point in my career where, I, as Trevor had mentioned, I was looking for a way to kind of distinguish myself, especially in a, a very challenging environment uh, that, uh, as, as we came off the back of the great financial crisis. Uh, in addition, I wanted to uh, basically just deepen my knowledge uh, as much as possible in the area of finance. And I think one of the things one of the things you take away aside from that uh, knowledge when you go through the CFA uh, candidate journey is that discipline and, and to be able to, to handle the rigor of the curriculum. And I think once you build that, that, that becomes like your foundation as you continue expanding your learning in, throughout your career, because you're never going to stop learning. Um, the, other, the other aspect I would also highlight which I think is a great benefit of being a CFA charter holder is the, is the member network. Um, you have a roughly, I want to say 160 local societies all around the world. Uh, Boston's the fifth largest society, which is over 6,000 members. Um, but you have, you know, my first society was a Tampa Bay society and it was through there. I was able to network and, and uh, meet uh, people that were able to help me out on my career journey. Dan, would you like to go next? Sure. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to have been included. Uh, I'm an associate at S&P Global Ratings. Um, I cover a portfolio of issuers in the travel, lodger, and uh, travel, lodging, and gaming sectors. Um, you know, in terms of my career journey, I came into S&P out of undergrad. It was heavily encouraged to take the CFA. The company was very financially supportive. Um, you know, it's kind of an unofficial requirement within the company to have two levels of the CFA or significant process towards a master's completed before becoming promoted to associate. So there was obviously a significant incentive to pursue the charter, but many of our senior leaders within the organization hold the charter. So I think there's pretty strong recognition of the broad financial background that the, you know, that's required to gain the charter and just the rigor of the exams and you know, everything that's, that says about a candidate. So, you know, I think it's been beneficial from that perspective. I've also just noticed that there's pretty broad, you know, recognition of value within the industry. Um, I've had recruiters pretty directly tell me that it's, you know, a significant strength in the application in comparison to other candidates and help you command a higher salary in the negotiation process. So, um, you know, I've seen the value in those ways. John, why don't you um, give us your insights and they'll ask Russell to um, close us for question one straight after. Yeah, so hi everyone, welcome. Um, I'm, I am a research analyst at Lord Abbott. I happen to cover the utilities and power space. So much of the US regulated uh, utilities as well as independent power producers um, that are in the index. Um, so my story into the CFA program was a natural extension of my college uh, degree at Wharton. Uh, so I graduated from University of Pennsylvania in 2016, and I studied finance and accounting at the Wharton School. So what I learned through my curriculum made level one was more or less a breeze for me. Um, but it was really at level two where I really realized this is a great program for someone who wants to get into buy side research. Uh, at Lord Abbott, it was expected of all young associates to be involved and in taking the CFA exams. 
um, is something that really improves our work capabilities uh, and also creates a camaraderie among the young associate classes. Um, by level three, I actually joined the CFA Society of New York. Uh, so that has been really helpful for me when I was trying to pass level three, uh, having that organization behind me, motivating me, uh, realizing this was the last leg of the marathon. So the combination of what I study at Penn, um, my work at Lord Abbott, as well as my involvement in the CFA Society of New York has been foundational to my success uh, with the CFA Charter. And I passed the exam in, uh, uh, in 2019 and I just got my charter this month. Congratulations on um, Chatham Land. Russell. Let's hear from yeah, and I'll wrap this up here. Uh, my name is Russ Minetti. I work for a company called ETF Global. Um, we're a data and research provider in the exchange traded fund space. Uh, so we really serve a diverse mix of clients across the investment and academic communities, uh, currently covering the US, Canadian, and soon to be European marketplaces. Um, you know, as opposed to the other panelists here, I'm really at the, the starting block in my CFA journey. Uh, I've yet to take the CFA level one exam, but I'm um, scheduled to do that in December. Um, and just to echo what um, you know, a lot of the, the points have been brought up, uh, my motivation was one, due to the, the nature of my job, uh, just for ETS in general, it uh, requires a, a broad level of uh, knowledge that spans a lot of different asset classes, investment strategies. Um, so just to be competent in my job, um, I need to have a grasp of all these different topic areas within finance that the CFA curriculum um, affords that sort of kind of knowledge. And then just really to looking ahead in my career to, to distinguish myself. Um, you know, the CFA curriculum is known for its, its depth and rigor. Um, so through my experience, you know, I've already noticed just studying the, the, the curriculum and not even taking the exam that I've learned a lot and it's benefited me in my job. So I think, you know, you do benefit from the journey and the, the studying outside of the CFA, um, not only attaining the, the charter itself. Um, and then once you do, like uh, Gary mentioned, and Gary just mentioned that, um, that the networks are invaluable. Um, there's regional chapters throughout the country, throughout the globe, you know, as opposed to an MBA, which I'm, I'm sure we'll make some comparisons later on this panel, but it's not specific to one school or one network. It's, it's a global network. So it really opens up the doors and uh, runs your career prospects um, tremendously. And, you know, even if you're, you know, looking to, to move in a different area from where you currently work, moving to new city, there's going to be those regional chapters that you can leverage and use to, to kind of advance yourself in your career. This is awesome, everyone. And uh, swear we didn't plan that, but Russell already started taking us um, in the direction I wanted to go as far as uh, the value that you derive in your day-to-day -day job from the CFA charter. So why don't I kick it off with you, John, and ask directly, how do you derive value from CFA in, uh, in your day-to-day -day job? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, I would say I derive value from the charter in three ways, through the recognition, to the work, work benefits that it uh, provides, and lastly, through networking. So in terms of recognition, if many of you on this call are interested in um, getting into the buy side, particularly if you want a career at a mutual fund, I would say getting that CFA level one that really will indicate in your interview that you're serious about getting into the mutual fund industry that you did put those 300 hours. So it's a great recognition of your effort and it's gonna help you out um, with your career. Looking once you, let's say, do get into research as I did, um, it really does help in your day-to-day -day work. Of course, the obvious things are equity research, uh, fixed income research and accounting that's brought up in the CFA curriculum. But one that's not nearly as obvious, I would say, is risk management and derivatives. But to give you just a quick example, I often have to talk to the IR head, which is the investor relation teams of uh, Calpine, NRG, and Vistra. And these are power companies that use the forward market in power to understand what are the fundamentals that could be impacting the valuation of that power company going to the future. So when I was studying through level two and I was trying to understand the Greeks, 
And those are the things that sometimes did come up in conversations. So having the CFA curriculum definitely helped me better understand investor relations and helped me make some better decisions in my investment uh, uh, recommendations. Finally, it's a networking from the CFA Society. Uh, and I think that's self-explanatory. There's so many great events. I became a vice chair for the Alternative Investment Group. So we're trying to organize events around private equity, around distress investing, around credit as well. So those are the three things I would like to highlight in terms of the value I derive. Russell, did you want to add anything and um, Trevor thereafter? Yeah, sure. So I, I kind of touched on it in my uh, initial question, our initial response, but the, the value I've gained from it is really with, I sit in a position where we're looking to understand ETFs and obviously to have a good understanding of ETFs, you have to understand the underlying assets they're intended to track or the underlying strategies they're intended to track. So a lot of what we've done is analysis around the dynamics between ETFs and their underlying holdings. So with, with that, I've really gained understanding, particularly um, like Jonathan was mentioned, the derivatives markets, understanding the differences between um, different contracts and you know, I think, think in terms of swaps and futures, well, swaps as a, uh, or futures as opposed to swaps are mark to market. And you just understand that as um, with swaps, you know, it's, the, it's a zero value at the initiation of the swap contract. So just understanding like the different valuation um, methodologies behind these different contracts and with all the underlying asset classes really benefited me um, in my job from um, you know, just gaining a sharper analysis and um, grasp ETFs themselves and um, you know the underlying cl asset classes that they that they are involved in. And I can build on that even from a you know typically in consulting it's more from a client management standpoint, um, but we do projects ranging from system implementations to advisory work to um, large program and project management. And our clients are traders. Our clients are on the buy side, the sell side. They're institutions. They're investors. They're banks. And so when you're working with these individuals, you may be sitting next to a head of risk management. You may be sitting next to a head trader. You may be sitting next to a portfolio manager as you're going through. Having the CFA distinction and the familiarity with such a wide range of investment products, um, risk management concepts, um, and just the other principles that underlie the, the financial industry enables you uh, from a consulting and client uh, management standpoint to interact with all these different individuals who hold different roles within financial institutions and speak their language. It, it really gives you that common understanding. Many of them are charter holders themselves um, where you can sit down and, and have a conversation and help understand what they're trying to accomplish in their business from an advisory capacity. That's, that's what we're there to do. Um, so it really becomes an invaluable skill set, uh, a lingua franca that you can use with everyone and, and that baseline understanding that you need to be able to work with folks across financial institutions. You know, I would just also add to that, these are all great comments, is that as a member charter holder, every year you're attesting when you renew your membership that you are committed to uh, following the code of ethics and the ethical guidelines and following all the rules and regulations within your markets. The bottom line is that when people interact with a person that has a CFA charter and the initials uh, CFA after their name, uh, they're working with someone who understands that they have to work, uh, they have to operate within uh, an ethical framework. Uh, and and um, if there are, they do not do that, if, they, if there's any violations, there's obviously going to be repercussions and they can, it could damage their reputation. So these are folks that are very sensitive to making sure that they act with honesty and integrity, uh, that they put their clients first uh, and that they put the, the profession first because it's the trust that in, the, in the financial marketplace. When you look at this all collectively, it's that trust that enables us to have a well-functioning financial marketplace that enables companies to raise funds at a very advantageous cost of capital. And that's how you, that's how you instill the integrity integrity that the the content the knowledge component is always going to be important but I think anyone can anyone can source that information with or without the designation it's helpful to have that all packaged up in a curriculum but the individuals who want to maintain having that CFA charter and everything they put it put into it to, in order to earn it they're going to have to make sure they follow the the code of ethics so I guess I would just echo the the comments I made in my introduction I mean the Brand value of the charter is substantial. I think I've experienced that both internally within S&P and both externally, you know, just in uh, 
interviewing for other jobs, speaking to people externally, and people certainly recognize the value of um, you know the, the dedication that it takes to actually earn it, and uh, the broad range of the broad range and depth of topics that you're exposed to. I think I would also echo the other points that were made about the value of the uh, you know the, the network that you gain access to, particularly with the local societies. Um, it's just a great way to. Um, you know, introduce yourself to interesting people will be exposed to new opportunities um, and, and just generally widen your network. Yeah, these are extremely awesome and super complimentary points from um, ethics, integrity to speaking to investment relations professionals. And, and thank you, Trevor, for casually dropping the term lingua franca into the conversation. I think it's the first time in 2020 I've, I've, I've heard that, uh, but common language is, is exactly right, especially as we have such an international audience. And um, uh, where I was going with that is, many of you are hiring managers yourselves, serve on interview panels and the like. So Dan, maybe kick off with you as someone who probably works for the largest company in terms of headcount. When you sit down to interview prospective candidates, many of the people on the other side of the screen. How do you think about the CFA? How do you regard those with the designation vis-a-vis -vis someone with similar background, but is not pursuing it or hasn't even thought about the designation? Yeah, so, so I mean, I think John mentioned this. I think for one thing, there's certainly a camaraderie among people who you know have, have passed the test that there's so much that goes into it. It can be such a grueling process. So I think it just, immediately creates common ground between you and, you know, someone who you've just met for the first time. You know, I think it also, like I mentioned, I think it just demonstrates that they've been exposed to um, a broad and deep set of topics that are, that are certainly relevant in the day-to-day -day, um, responsibilities of the role. And, and I think, um, you know, similar to attaining a master's, it's just, I guess it, it adds to your, your pedigree, your credibility. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's definitely a significant boost for a candidate, particularly when you're applying to an organization where uh, many of the professionals in that organization already have the charter. I think the, the you know, kind of the, the greater, the critical mass of professionals who already have it within the organization that you want to work in, the more valuable the charter is. And for S&P, you know, a significant percentage of the analysts hold the charter. So I would say for an interviewee, it's incredibly valuable. Uh, terrific. Uh, would uh, maybe uh, Gary, then um, Russell would like to weigh in next on the interview job value of the CFA, please. Sure. So uh, in my prior role, I actually managed a team of research associates and I was involved in the hiring process. And I will say that when, when someone has a CFA charter, it, it helps us. Um, they're able to better understand the language, particularly in the world of equity research. Um, we understand, you know, that person has a deeper knowledge um, just in, in, in all things finance. And of course, that, there's that commitment to ethics. So we know we're going to have less of a probability of, of any kind of um, unethical behavior with that individual. I think one of the things that, you know, the import, like when you, when you look at the areas of emphasis in the exams, for instance, level one financial statement analysis was a major focus. That's it's pretty helpful uh, in the sense that when, when you're dealing, particularly in the world of, of equity research, when you're analyzing companies and, and, and looking at um, their financial statements, sometimes it's, it's important to know the interaction of the different components. So for instance, if I if I'm a bank and I'm booking reserves, what is that? That's, you know, that's what, how does that interact within my balance sheet? Um, and, and what's going to, what's going to happen to my ROE? Um, you know, if, if I move my margin figure one way or another. So being able to make those connections um, is going to be important. I think folks that, that have gone through the charter um, have underwent that training and that discipline. Uh, and so it really helps out with, with finding someone um, that, that can be able to, to land in a role and be able to, to, to hit the road running. Yeah, I'll just quickly add to that. I think, um, you know, some of the other panelists have touched on this, but it really makes you, when you're considering a job candidate, it's not going to guarantee you a job, but it's really going to put you on the top of a resume pile or make you stand out from other candidates. Um, just the, the CFA charter itself conveys um, a certain level of dedication and knowledge um, that you wouldn't otherwise have without it on your resume. So 
it's, it's really beneficial and it's kind of a, a great way to um, start a, a conversation with a prospective job candidate um, and they can you know, build off that knowledge level because it's very relevant to a lot of different areas within the financial services industry. Um, so it's going to have applicability to um, you know, a whole, whole host of different, um, different job opportunities. John, yeah, maybe so, followed by Trevor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of the interview weight, I think the CFA designation and testing the levels will help you get that interview. And once you're in the interview in general, I would say it will be less quantitative. It's going to be more time talking about your qualitative background. It's going to be more about getting to know you because they have confidence that you can come in and do the work. So what that means is fewer brain teasers uh, and if that's something that, you know, gets you nervous during an interview scenario, that could be a benefit for you. Um, but I, in general, even though I do well on the brain teachers, I like the fact that I'm spending more time talking about myself, highlighting my qualitative contributions to Lord Abbott. I'll just add to that a, a couple of things that I look for when I, I see someone who's a charter holder. Um, I, I hire consultants. At the end of the day, consultants are problem solvers. And it, coming to the CFA program requires a high degree of diligence, critical thinking, and structured problem solving. So when you see someone who has that designation, you know that, that you know, they, they've got those skills. They were able to pass an incredibly rigorous program, um, and they know how to think critically. And when they're approaching a business problem, they're going to apply structures, they're going to apply methodologies, um, and, and those lead to good business solutions. So for me, it's not just the depth of expertise and the, the domain knowledge that they possess. They're critical thinkers and they're problem solvers. And at the end of the day, that's what you need in the world of business. Yeah, that's um, wonderful. And I, I think that uh, the perspectives that uh, folks just put out there really solidifies the debate and uh, the value that not only do you derive, but your employer and, and your future colleagues describe to, to those pursuing uh, the CFA and I, I love especially I think John you made the point that being a level one candidate and passing the exam already puts you ahead of the curve especially since we know many folks at the undergraduate level there are now CFA exams in February and in May and these uh, uh, computer-based testing more accessible and that would be a, a great opportunity However, with change comes a fair amount of apprehension. Um, although there is more exam availability, the windows are, are wider, the testing format is different. And uh, with that, I'd like to ask Gary, if uh, you have any advice uh, to folks thinking about registering for level one in the new world today. So I think, you know, it's interesting times where we are in for sure. I mean, uh, there was a time where you could take the exam only once a year. And now it's a game changer for, for people to take level two or level three twice a year. You know, imagine the folks that had a, you know, repeated level two or level three multiple times. Those are multiple years that they've, they've missed out on. So the overall candidate journey has been shortened. And I think that's an advantage to everyone. The, in addition to that, uh, my understanding with level one, the, the questions, the number of questions is will be going down from 240 to 180 next year. Uh, paired up with that, of course, you'll have lesser time to complete the exam to, to make it proportional. And I think, uh, you know, there'll be agreements or disagreements. But one thing I'll tell folks is that um, don't get caught up with the logistics. Just get, focus on the content, focus on the exam, focus on the practice questions and, and, and the areas that you need to, to strengthen your knowledge and worry about the logistics at the end. I mean, you know, it's funny to see people kind of stressing about the computer-based testing world, but the reality is paper-based testing is not uh, something to be thrilled about. I mean, there was a time where you had to like print out an admission certificate uh, and you bring that in and you got to bring in your passport and, and this and that. And, and it's, uh, so it should be much more streamlined of a process now. So I don't want to get too caught up with that, but just focus on the content and um, just consider yourselves fortunate to actually have a, a shortened candidate journey if you're able to pass these exams on the first attempt. And uh, as luck would have it, they actually have the candidate uh, here with us. Uh, Russell, maybe you can give a, 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 a live participant perspective on how you're coping with all the changes and how you're um, making sure that you're cool, calm, and successful. 
Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, so when this announcement came out, it was it was music to my ears. Uh, you know, I'd really already valued the the CFA charter just due to its um, from a cost perspective compared to an MBA. But this really shortens the time frame to get it. So now you're on the equal playing field from a time perspective, too. Um, so it's it's really um, exciting to know that you'll be able to take it on a more frequent basis. Um, so you just won't have this really drawn out you know, uh, pursuit of the CFA charter. Um, so and, and then also for just now being computer based testing, um, we're kind of venturing into unknown territory. You know, I'll be the, uh, among the, the first candidates to, to uh, participate in this sort of testing. So it'll be interesting to see, but you know, I can't imagine it'll be all that much different from the paper-based testing. Um, the questions are still going to be the same. You're still going to have the same, uh, enter with the same level of preparation. So I don't think it should be um, concerning to any candidates. It's, it's more of um, a welcome, welcome change, I think, um, for all future candidates. I guess I'll throw it open to others. You're not directly impacted by maybe a hearing from colleagues or others in the network reaching out to you. Any, any thoughts or observation from other panelists on uh, the testing format and advice for level one aspiring registrants? Yeah, I have something to say from my personal experience. Um, I, I joined Lord Abbott before I started taking the CFA exams. So something that um, was decided uh, was that rather than potentially finishing the entire curriculum in one and a half year, they recommended that I do it over three years, taking an exam once per year. Because, you know, getting into research, getting to understand how to do security evaluation is a tough job in itself. And if you were to just do everything in a year and a half, you might not get a full benefit from both your job as well as your charter. So even through, I would say the exams that give you the optionality, that doesn't mean that you should feel pressured to complete the exam in the quickest possible timeline. It should be something that fits your background, where you are in life, where you are with your family. And I think more optionality is great to help you out with that. Oh, that's um, great. Um, we're uh, receiving awesome number of high quality questions. So uh, I want to leave time for the panelists to field those. So let me move us to the lightning speed round, uh, 60 seconds each, starting with John. What I would like you to share with the audience, please, is any tips, tricks, suggestions that you yourself wish someone told you when you set out in your CFA journey. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is that focus on doing practice problems and not necessarily spend the entire time reading the material. I would say your ability to pass on exam day is how well you can understand problems and solve problems in a good logical way. In that way, I did use the Kaplan resources all three, for all three levels, and that was instrumental. Um, particularly, I remember what was really helpful was this four-day boot camp where they had an extra set of 200 some word questions that I was just able to blow through before the exam. And I felt that hours spent, uh, well, those hours spent doing those questions far outweighed the benefits that I got from uh, reading the chapters. That's more personal, but it did help me. That's uh, very gracious. Dan, Russell? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, my uh, my strategies haven't been put to the test yet, but from what I've learned, um, you know, obviously problems are a critical component of being prepared for this the CFA exam. So um, Jonathan hit it right on the head. Uh, do as many practice problems as you can. Uh, that's sort of where I found you know as I've completely drilled down in different topic areas, just going with Kaplan, with the Q Bank, reviewing the the CFA level questions. That's really helped me in a better understanding of um, the various topic areas. Um, also, lean on the advice of um, other charter holders. Pick their brains on, on, on this. Obviously, it's gonna be depend on your circumstances, what kind of job you're, you're, on, you're in, what your family work balance is, what bills you have. So just to, to pick as many brains as possible and kind of, um, together a uh, strategy that, that fits your circumstances. I think um, that's something that I wish I had 
thought about a little bit more before um, beginning my CFA journey. Um, I think it was something to um, serve all, uh, all future candidates well. So in my personal experience preparing for the exams, I think the key to success for me was just having a good system, um, you know, doing things like setting incremental goals, tracking your progress, being consistent in studying, uh, making sure you're studying, you know, the right way that works for you, maybe not necessarily what your friends are doing or what you read online. I think there's a period of experimentation um, that you go through and then you learn the best and most time efficient way for you to prepare and obtain the information you need for the exam. So, so I think it's just about positioning yourself so that you can get in a groove and then you can, you know, crank through the multiple months of studying required to be prepared for the exam. At least for me, multiple months of studying. I know some people are more gifted than that, but uh, so that was my experience. Uh, great advice all. Uh, Gary and um, last but not least, Trevor, what's, what's your lightning round advice? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, first of all, as there, there are no shortcuts. I, I think you, you have to make sure you don't bite off more than you can chew. Be, be realistic with where you are in your life. Some folks can commit a lot of time to studying because they're in a different life situation versus others. So be realistic about that and try not to be too aggressive with the exam timeline, if it, especially now with this new computer-based testing schedule that we're seeing. It, you have, you're afforded more options. Um, than candidates in past years to be able to take uh, the first, second, third level of the exam. Um, the other thing I would also add, um, you know, I would emphasize that as, as important as to do practice questions, you want to get the readings out of the way. You got to set goals for yourself to focus on the readings because you can't really try to, don't waste your, you don't want to waste those questions when you don't know uh, anything, any of the content. Otherwise, you're just going to see the answer and then you're, that question goes to waste. Focus on learning the content and then let, then, then test your knowledge with those questions. And the third thing I would say is uh, get creative with how you make time for studying for the exam. I've, I've studied with other people and whether they were at coffee shops uh, staying late in the office at nights when everyone was gone or just uh, going to local community college libraries, what have you. Obviously, in this day and age, it's a little bit different, but still try to get creative to find that quiet space so you can really focus in on these readings and, and get through the material. I, I agree 100% with all the tips that we've heard so far. I'll, I'll add two just kind of smaller practical ones. Uh, the first one being don't sleep on ethics. The ethics readings are critical that knowledge and of, of really the, the subject matter around that um, helps so much. It gives you a section that you'd be confident going into. And it's a huge part of the curriculum. Uh, a lot of people get caught up on all the more analytical pieces, but the ethics is key. Uh, and then finally, and this may change a little bit in the computer-based testing world, but your calculator is your best friend. You, you have to know, be comfortable with it, know everything that you need to know before you get in there, be familiar with all the functions you're gonna use. Um, those are just two little things that you don't want to go wrong on exam day. Be good with your calculator, be good with ethics. Um, it really helps you focus on the other things that, that may be more challenging. Wow, terrific advice. And uh, as good as um, we have been, the, the, the best part of the presentation is about to commence, which is of course driven by your questions, meaning the audience. I will try and loosely group them um, as to why take the challenge and then um, back to the, the, the practical advice. So uh, let's, let's try and go with John on this one uh, because you, you talked about your career journey. Um, what are the typical analyst jobs that, uh, aspects of the analyst job that the chart is particularly helpful to? Yeah, so if you look at a typical analyst, I would say most of his days are spent updating models, listening to earnings call, uh, going to conferences so that you are with your senior analyst at one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, and as well as just having a really good fundamental understanding for your sector. So those are what I would say is the general requirement. And I feel like the CFA charter provides you the tools. Let's just say the fact that, you know, as an analyst, you have to read a lot. You might think the CFA curriculum has a lot of pages, but wait until you become a buy side analyst covering 60 companies and going through earnings seasons, you're listening to 50 different earnings call, as well as trying to understand what's going on in the 10 Qs, the management discussion and analysis. 
you, I would say in a typical quarter, I am reading well over two to 3,000 pages of content. So that CFA material, just getting you in the groove of reading, probably is gonna be helping you uh, succeed in research. That's um, great um, real life bootcamp advice there, thank you. Um, how about you, Gary, for, for, for the next one? Uh, the question is, um, any thoughts and suggestions to maintain mental toughness and make sure that you combine uh, work, personal life, study without burning out? That's a, that's a good one. Mental toughness is, uh, is, uh, is important because you have to have it to go through this. I think it's important to, when it comes to work, I, I have different feelings about this. I think that I have the attitude of, if you try to involve many people and try to talk to many people, you're just not going to focus on what it is the task is. It's, it's you that's going in to take the exam, not the people you talk to. Um, so I have the, the attitude that uh, just, just focus on, on making the time at work, maybe even talk to your manager at, at most uh, to see if you can carve out time in your day. There are companies today, by the way, that will offer you in addition to your vacation time, study time. I never had that opportunity, but, uh, but, you, if you have that opportunity, take advantage of it. In terms of your family and loved ones, just let them know. Let them know what the commitment is going to be. I remember when I first started, when I first signed up for the exam, um, they send you along with your textbooks uh, a bunch of postcards, and they would, you know, these postcards would say, "Sorry, I haven't talked to you in a few months, and I hope everything's well." And, and it just, it would, it would be kind of comical and, and, and just kind of uh, add some levity to the situation. But the point being is that the folks that, that are important in your life need to understand that you're making a commitment, and it's a time commitment, and it's not going to be forever, hopefully. But as long as they understand that, they know not to bother you when you need that study time. That's uh, great. Staying with. Um... The particulars of the charter, I think, Dan, this is probably the most recent uh, for you, is uh, which level of the CFA did you find the hardest and why? So I certainly found level two to be by far the hardest. I think that's kind of a common experience. I think that the content on level two is probably the most difficult. And not that level three is a walk in the park, but, you know, by level three, you, you kind of have things down. You, under, you understand what the right systems and processes are for you, you know how to study, you know, you know what will be required of you to pass the exam. So I'd say content wise, there's a difference between level two and three and level one. But I think that level two is the most challenging because you know, you're really engaging in that level of difficulty for the first time. Not that level one is by any means a walk in the park, but I think there's a significant step up in difficulty. So that was my personal experience. Uh, thank you. That's. Um statistically what we hear quite a lot about um, from uh, candidates. Um, Trevor, pivoting back to what this is all about in terms of uh, career pathing, how useful uh, in your opinion is um, CFA Charter for those that are looking to break into consulting, investment banking, and uh, other jobs that are not directly on the career path of investment management? Yeah, absolutely. And it's still so relevant. Um, as I mentioned before, you're going to be working with other charter holders who are going to be on your client side when you are in a consulting role or who are in investment banking management positions. Um, those, those industry-wide credentials become so valuable in this business. Um, and it's because, again, of, of everything that it brings along with it. It demonstrates that you've been able to um, you know, navigate the time management challenges that Gary was just speaking about to progress in your career, to manage family and personal commitments and get through a grueling curriculum. Um, it, it shows that you can manage all those commitments simultaneously, um, which again, critical in any role. It shows that you have the foundations of the financial services industry um, and it shows that you're a critical thinker. So it, it really does go a long way when you're getting into um, careers in, in fields that are tangential to the traditional buy side, sell side analyst roles where, where the CFA is a little more prevalent. Um, I, I know when we're doing hiring, we view it almost as equivalent to an MBA when folks are coming in. Um, it, it gives you that, that credential, that experience, um, and, and something that's just recognized globally. It, it's really important to have. So let me stay with you. I know you just mentioned MBA, so maybe give us your take. I think a few other panelists also have some strong views on the subject. So CFA versus MBA, 
vexing subject? What's, what's, your, what's your reaction? Yeah, absolutely. I, I struggled with it a little bit myself in making the decision with which one to pursue. Um, for me, uh, a lot of it was the ability to continue working. Uh, I, I liked the role that I was in. I liked the company that I was, I was with, um, was on a good career trajectory at the time, um, but wanted to make sure I was pursuing further education of, of some sort. I'm a strong believer in lifetime learning. Um, and, and for me, the curriculum really fit into my schedule. I didn't want to take two years off. Um, I wanted to keep working towards my career goals. Um, it was a challenge to manage the time commitment, as everyone here has spoken to. You have to be able to balance a lot of competing priorities. Um, and you have to communicate with leadership at your company, your clients, whomever you're working with to make sure you can carve out the time. But it really allowed me to pursue dual goals all at once, making sure I was picking up this credential and continuing to further my education while also continuing to get ahead at work and, and, and push towards goals there. Um, for me, being able to fit that schedule was really the decision maker for me. Russ, I think you mentioned uh, your own sort of thought process around CFN in Vienna. Gary, I think you may have both even, so I would love to hear from you as well. Maybe starting with Russell. Yeah, I'll uh, quickly comment on that. Uh, similar to, to Trevor, I really valued the, the ability to, to continue working on my current job and well, so while pursuing the CFA charter. Um, I know there's some part-time MBA programs, but I think for all, at least a lot of MBA holders really benefit the in-person experience um, and what that experience, um, the benefits of that experience uh, provides. So I thought for initially for what my goals were to continue on the career directory I was on, while also building out my, um, my knowledge base, um, I, I felt the CFA charter was best suited for that. So this is, uh, these are great comments. This was a question I, I had evaluated as well, as will anyone. I think you have to look at the fact that you're going to make some time commitment in your life um, to, to further your education and what would be the best path because, you know, you're not going to get that time back. So um, I would say that both, both avenues have their merits. I think it depends on where it is you want to go in your career. Now, in this today's day and age, if I was a person exploring both programs today, I would definitely factor in the current environment that we're in where you basically are having to be subject to remote learning. And ask yourself whether that actually justifies the cost because a lot of these schools have not changed the cost of these programs. So how, how do you factor that in? The other thing too is that uh, even before pandemic, I think you know, there have been signs that these MBA programs have kind of been on the wane, not necessarily at the top tier schools, but uh, just broadly speaking, if I were looking at uh, my journey to career journey today and I wanted to be in finance, um, I would definitely consider, still consider the CFA charter. But in addition to that, I think one, per, one thing you have, people have to keep in mind going forward is you have to be versatile from a technological standpoint. Um, and you know, where we hear about situations where people are opting for Silicon Valley versus uh, Wall Street, um, not saying that that's necessarily gonna be the, 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 the choices that people make, but it would be helpful for folks to develop a background in, in, in programming, computer programming, whether it's learning pro, uh, languages like Python or, or, or R, so that you can apply that quantitative approach to the analysis you do. Because the skills that we've learned that, that are being used, um, um, have, that have been used over the past couple of decades, they're, they're pretty antiquated. There's, the, the game's gonna be pushed out pretty further and um, you want to make sure you're prepared for that. These are um, uh, great insights. And I want to uh, sort of take a, a, a different stab at it and ask um, Dan to comment. So um, I, I think the way I understand the question is, how do you find the motivation? How do you actually say, I'm taking the plunge, I'm doing it, I have a job or I have a a number of commitments, but it's it's still worth it uh, given everything else that's going on. Um, how did you make that decision? How can you help others in making a similar call? That's that's a really good question. Um, you know, and that's that's a tough component of it. I think for me at least, I would say the challenge was more in getting started. You know, it's such it, it can be um, an overwhelming seeming process, you know, to prepare yourself for the exams, the length and the effort that's required. I think once I got into studying, you know, I was more motivated by the fact that I had already committed 
so much time that I, I might as well pass the test, right? You know, what, once you get to a certain point, I think you're motivated just by not wanting to, to have wasted the time that you already spent preparing. And that, that's kind of what I observed with the other analysts that I work with. I think getting started is the, the difficult part. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like maybe getting into a cold pool. You just need to get started and then you, you, you roll from there. Terrific. Any other thoughts and ideas on how to take the first step on the journey of a thousand miles? One thing that was big for me was um, finding kind of an accountability partner uh, or, or a buddy to go through it with you. Um, I knew some other individuals who were all thinking about it. We were all on the edge together um, and, you know, basically all decided, all right, we're all going to take the plunge. And then it becomes, all right, did you start studying last night? Because because I did. Um, and, and then you, you support each other through the journey. That was really helpful. Um, and the other thing I had is um, having somebody at work who, who's kind of an advocate for you, an advocate for the program or a, a, another charter holder who can help guide you through it and, and give you some of that coaching and support. It, it's challenging. It is a really hard program. There's no doubt about it. So having that support network, whether it's um, you know folks that have done it before or folks that are doing it the same time as you, that really helps keep you, not just keep you motivated, but also give you that little push that you need. Um, thank you. Um, I guess I'll, I'll pose it to, to you, John. Um, the question comes from a current student who finds that a lot of employers looking for roles require experience and then people are, even though they're studying for the charter, looking to gain experience paid or unpaid. Do you have any suggestions uh, on, on how folks can uh, maybe volunteer or find ways of gaining that experience and, and demonstrating it to their prospective employers? Yeah, um, so I have a friend who joined Lord Ab in my year, but he worked on sales. So he wanted to get into investment. So he just actually happened to, uh, he uh, went unemployed about uh, a year ago, and he's now just volunteering to help out a portfolio manager that also left the firm. And through that pro bono uh, experience, he's actually doing some investment research, writing reports. I think that's going to really help him eventually break in because experience doesn't have to be paid experience. Things that you do through internships, through just reaching out to a portfolio manager, asking if I could, um, you know, you probably can reach out to an established firm, but let's say someone's trying to establish an RIA and, um, you know, he used to be a PM, you could reach out and say, hey, could I help you look at, a, let's say, five investments? Um, so that's the most interesting way I've seen people do it that weren't able to break in directly with uh, work experience. Now that's uh, a great suggestion and there are literally half a million RIAs out there. So John, I think that's super actionable for those that uh, ask the question. Uh, Trevor, this one calls you out by name, um, uh, given the quality of, of some of the insights you shared. Do you think there are any resources that are uh, available, particularly for the undergrad students uh, as they prepare for the exam as part of their employment positioning? So, so absolutely. I mean, your, your school's career services, especially when you're an undergrad, is a great resource that I, I know when I was an undergrad, I did not take advantage enough of. Um, the, the folks there are well networked. Employers come to them as you're looking to, to make those connections. Um, another resource I wasn't even aware of when I was an undergrad is, is the local CFA societies, um, either in a, a target city in which you eventually want to move or if, if your school is located in a large city, there's probably a CFA society either there, there or nearby. A great way to connect with, with employers as well, um, get to know some folks. Um, and then many large companies are, are going to be active on your campuses, even this fall in our, our remote world. I know we're trying to figure out how does hiring on campus work when everybody's on a Zoom call. Um, but, but again, your, the campus resources are really working hard this fall to help undergrad students connect with employers. Um, so, so that's a great way. Um, and, and then um, hopefully that was kind of where the, the question was going there. Um, but again, back to the CFA charter side of it as well, those local societies can provide great resources for studying and getting connected to people who can help you understand how that charter would fit in with where you want to go in terms of your career. Um, when you're looking at different geographies and areas you may want to live, gives you a good profile of what employers are in that area. Um, and I bet you can connect with some pretty influential people to help guide you on your career. 
Now that's a, a, a terrific point and uh, Gary, you obviously have your finger very much live on the button on the student community outreach. Uh, generically, and of course I'll share specific details with those that are interested on the society level, but Gary, how do folks normally interact? What sort of services societies like CFS, Society of Boston, provides to folks uh, that are interested in things we've just talked about for the past 55 minutes? Yeah, so your local societies are, are an important gateway in your career. It's a very important stopping point in your in your journey uh, being a CFA charter holder. So off the bat, um, the, the, main, the main value that I think that's derived from being a member of societies is that continuous learning, continuous education. There are many great speakers that make their ways around. It used to be physically, but now it's virtually, which is actually even um, in some cases, even more advantageous. Those programs are provided uh, exclusively for members. Um, and if you're, if you're our member, you're usually at no charge. Um, so you have a benefit there to be able to access great content from some of the highest from the from some of the best thought leaders that are out there in addition to that there are there are other services that your local societies provide they provide career services um, they provide mentorship opportunities they also provide volunteering opportunities i'll give you an example uh, at cfa society of boston we have our uh, financial literacy um, initiative where a lot of investment professionals um, basically band together they develop coursework and they partner up with various organizations to go and teach uh, just kind of the basics uh, of nuts and bolts of finance um, to to communities that may be disadvantaged or that, that need that that component of education um, and i think that gives you good exposure because there are a lot of folks that are in that volunteer for these roles that are also in leadership positions at their firms um, except you just see them wearing you know a pair of blue jeans and a normal you know t-shirt you know but it, you'll be surprised at the folks you run into so it's a good way for you to network uh, and be part of a community uh, that will help you out in your career now that's uh, absolutely, and uh, in the interest of finishing on, uh, on time, we might wind it down. So what I just want to say is really um, thank from um, the bottom of everyone's heart, uh, all of our panelists, um, and uh, of course, uh, if you do want to connect with the societies, or if there is something that from a Kaplan perspective we can do to help, um, by all means, um, send me an email. Uh, it's paul.kavarsky at kaplan.com. But uh, at the end of the day, thank you for making this event so special. We've had uh, people from four continents. You stayed the distance. And that's, uh, that's a tell, right? You know, being able to stay the distance is key to your CFA charter success. And I'm sure that uh, all of my panelists would agree that that perseverance, the grit, as well as, as, as your uh, intellect is something that would help you succeed, whatever career you choose, and whether the CFA Charter is helpful to you or not. So on behalf of Kaplan, CFA Society New York, CFA Society Boston, Washington DC, and our Alliance Educational uh, Friends at ETF Global, we sure thank you for joining us uh, this Wednesday and uh, wish you a wonderful rest of the day. <laughs>